Now we need to remember that ventilators and other capital equipment are not single use and in most parts will be around with us for some years to come. Thus, even in an enduring COVID world, and I hope not, purchases of capital equipment are going to have to plateau. What then becomes of all this new manufacturing capability? Hello, I'm Daniel Teo, Managing Partner for Honeywell Lake Ventures. COVID came to us like a maelstrom from out of the blue and changed life as we knew it. Since then, analysts and investors have been trying to understand what this might mean for investments in medical devices. Over the next few minutes, I will of course share what we at Honeywell are seeing, but more importantly, during these difficult times, we want to honor and celebrate how the medical device industry has come together in this epic fight, one that's for the history books. The fact that COVID triggered massive volatility in the public markets is no longer news. The S&P 500 lost nearly 30% of its value in the month between February 19 and March 20, but it also recovered nearly 60% of those losses in the next 30 days. Analysis of the 2008 crash and other market shocks suggest that it may take up to three years for the public markets to fully recover the remaining 40%. Historical data, however, also suggests that private equity and venture capital markets recover much faster, usually within the next six to 12 months. If we look at the five largest medical device companies in the US, uh, we see that they've weathered the storm pretty well too. Abbott gaining 23% post versus pre-COVID, while J&J, Medtronic, and others have seen declines that are only a fraction of the turmoil seen in other sectors. Some of this, of course, has been helped by positive institutional response. The Corona Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act poured some $8.3 billion into healthcare, including $800 million to the NIH and $61 million to the FDA. Various government agencies, including the FDA, have implemented accelerated pathways for the development and deployment of effective life-saving COVID-related solutions. In Europe, COVID was the last and final straw that persuaded the EU to postpone the transition to MDR by one full year. Now, funding for COVID-related research and product development is also coming not just from the US, but from Canada, the Australia, UK, and many other countries. While governments have been the largest source of these funds, there have also been significant contributions from international organizations, NGOs, universities, and private foundations. In all, a total of $8 billion has been set aside for COVID-related research and product development. The good news, is that 70% of these grants, or about $7 billion, are still open for application. To help startups access these resources, Honeywell has compiled a list of 129 grants that worldwide that as of July 1st will still be open for application. Now the full list is now available on our website as a small public service to all startups who are committed to this fight. In the private sector, many countries, large and small, have pivoted at least a part of their business to addressing the COVID threat. But true heroes of our story here are the medical device startups. In the course of researching this topic, Honeywell ended up compiling a list of companies who are contributing to the fight against COVID. The Honeywell Index of Medical Device Startups Against COVID currently has 268 companies on the list, and it's growing by the day as we hear more stories from the field. Many are company CEOs who have either accelerated the development of or have pivoted their original technologies and device towards a COVID solution, often in the face of inferior business economics and sometimes against the better judgment and at least one or two occasions against the wishes of their boards. These are emerging companies in this list here that in addition to the challenge that come with commercializing the original product are now taking on a rapidly changing environment in the age of COVID. Companies that may be barely able to pay salaries but are now risking it all to contribute to the fight. Companies that are joining the fight, not because they're compelled by legislation like the Defense Production Act, but do so because they feel compelled to help. Companies like Akara Technologies or Akara Robotics that repurpose its autonomous social robots to disinfect hospitals by bathing them in UV light or like Cellularity that launched a clinical trial to remove the COVID virus from infected cells using allogeneic cell therapy. 
This list is also accessible on our website so that more people will come to know about their efforts and to cheer them on. The other thing that we should be celebrating is how the industry has come together to help these startups. You know, we've continued to entertain nearly 100 pitches and have judged in a number of pitch competitions remotely and online since the country went on COVID lockdown in March. However, one of the most fulfilling experiences was when I was a part of a group of 60 investors and domain experts in various fields, all coming together in a single session organized by the nonprofit MedTech Innovator. Not to make an investment or pick a winner, but to help pressure test the design, the development plans, and deployment strategies of 15 startups who are already developing or have pivoted to a COVID-related solution. Why? So as to give these worthy ventures access to the best help available and the best chances of success at bringing to market badly needed innovations to fight COVID. So some of you have suggested that these companies may have pivoted because they saw a commercial opportunity, or maybe they did. But if you look closer and you see that oftentimes the COVID health economics is not nearly as attractive as their original revenue model. At Honeywell, we look beyond the obvious. Everyone knows that COVID diagnostics, remote monitoring, ventilators, and other respiratory health products will be needed. Now we need to remember that ventilators and other capital equipment are not single use, and in most parts will be around with us for some years to come. Thus, even in an enduring COVID world, and I hope not, purchases of capital equipment are going to have to plateau. What then becomes of all this new manufacturing capability? With the increased caseloads in expensive radiology and specialist suite due to COVID, we see hospital systems under pressure to migrate treatment from the surgery suite to the bedside, from the bedside to the outpatient, from the outpatient to home consultation and self-treatment. Accordingly, we believe that there is growth in at least four other areas of medical technologies that are less obvious. In renal health, 15 to 10% of COVID patients also present acute kidney injuries as a comorbidity. Already, Medicare is burdened to the tune of $114 billion for renal care, or 20% of its budget. Now, without new technologies, that number is going to be much higher going forward. Mortality rate is also horrendously high at 20 to 25% and a five-year survivability rate of 35%. We believe that the new generations of home and portable dialysis currently being developed by startups will significantly reduce mortality rates, avoid infection risk in centralized dialysis centers, and improve patient mobility and lifestyle. Similarly, 18 to 23% of COVID patients also show some form of gastrointestinal malfunction. Advanced, non-invasive, preferably point-of-care diagnostic technologies and treatment modalities will therefore be more badly needed than ever before, as patients try to avoid hospitals wherever possible. We also know that COVID damages soft tissue, leading to secondary complications. Thus, we believe that high-precision, energy-based surgical instruments, innovative wound closure and tissue healing technologies will also be in high demand. And finally, we believe that it's time to do away with all the messy wires and bed or instrument bound monitoring devices. Instead, thin, innocuous, fabric woven and HIPAA compliant communications technologies are now sufficiently mature so that smart garments that are both functional and stylistic are ready for prime time. It is therefore no accident that Honeywell, which invests in surgical innovations, finds its investment mandate of see, treat and heal uh, to be highly aligned with the needs of a post COVID world from various visualization and navigation technologies to next-gen energy devices or novel GNI procedures to wound care, tissue healing, and home and portable dialysis, Honeywell stands ready to invest in technologies that will be able to help us deal better with the current pandemic and fend off whatever might come next. In conclusion, while COVID is a dark chapter, the prospect for medical devices, particularly in the startup VC space, is brighter than ever before. The way the industry has responded has been heartwarming. And while not exactly at the front line, but their products are, medical device startups still face challenges getting their innovations to market and needs all of the encouragement and help we can give. To this end, we salute the 268 companies that are recognized and honored in our list of medtech startups in the fight against COVID. And for the sake of us all, we wish them success. Thank you.